Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to start a multi-part series on creating braids in the new hair system in Blender 3.3 Beta. In this video, we're going to take a look at creating the braids. To create these braids, we're going to use a procedural formula that came from a paper by Sofia Ogunsaiten, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, from Pixar Animation Studios. There'll be a link to the paper in the description. Using this formula, we're going to generate our basic outlines of our braids, like you see here. So let's jump right into it. This is the part of the paper that we're going to be looking at. This function describes the points along a curve and how we're going to wrap our procedural braids around that curve. While this looks pretty complicated, we're going to break it down as much as we can. First, we're going to add in a curve and give it a geometry node tree. We can see here that we have several variables that we're going to be able to define. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. For the X component of our curves, we have A, which is a scalar for the braids width and height at each control vertex. Then we have the sine of two pi times the frequency of the knots, this alpha value at the given point T plus this delta value. Delta is equal to the current strand that we're on divided by the total number of strands, starting at one and going up to the total number of strands. For our purposes, we're going to define our own Z value, and you'll see why in a few minutes. So A, B, and F are three values that we're going to input. So let's go ahead and add those to our group input. Next, we have this beta and alpha variable. And the only real information we have about this is that there's a 2 to 1 ratio between them. So if beta is 1, alpha is going to be 2. So for the purposes of this video, we'll just go ahead and hard code 2 and 1 for these values. For our delta, we're going to get i procedurally, and then we have n number of strands. So we want to be able to input the number of strands. These values should get us where we want to go. I'm going to go ahead and give them a little bit more descriptive name. Now since we're going to be generating x, y, and z coordinates, let's go ahead and add a combined x, y, z node. Let's go ahead and work out our x function. First we have a times the sine of this equation. So we'll bring out a and multiply it and we're gonna be multiplying it by the sine of some value. So we'll bring this back, change it to sine, and plug it in here. Now what's the value that we're gonna take the sine of? The first half is f times alpha at point t. So we'll bring out f and multiply it by alpha. And now we already determined that since this just needs to be a constant of 0.5 between the two of them, we'll just make alpha two and beta one. So we'll just put in two here. And to get this value at the current point of the curve, we're gonna multiply it by the current length of our spline. So if I duplicate my multiply, add a spline parameter node, and choose the length. So now this is multiplying our f times alpha times the current length of the control point we're on in our curve. Now before we take the sine, we have to add delta. Delta was our current strand divided by the number of strands we have. Right now, we only have our main curve. So to make this single curve into multiple, we're going to use a duplicate elements node. And we're going to duplicate it by the number of strands we've chosen. Now i will be represented by our duplicate index. So we can take i and divide it by the total number of strands. This equation wants i to start at one and go to the number of strands. The duplicate index is going to go from zero to the number of strands minus one. So we will want to add one to our duplicate index. Here's one hint that I've come across to keep your node trees a little more readable. Since the output of this value is going to be delta, I'll pull out a reroute node and while I can press F2 and give it a label, that label is pretty small. So instead, I'm going to remove that label 
and with just my reroute node selected, I'm going to press Ctrl J. This will put a frame around just my reroute node. And now with my frame selected, I'll press F2 and put in Delta. Now, of course, on Windows, I can press Ctrl semicolon and get an actual Delta. Then I can come to the properties of my node tree and make the label as big as I can. So now there's a very clear entry for Delta on my screen. With that done, I'll add my F alpha T value to Delta and take the sign. After we've added Delta to this term, we need to multiply it by 2 pi. One shorthand for 2 pi is the word tau, T-A-U. So I simply need to multiply this value by tau and then take the sign. So now these nodes will represent our x value. Next we'll generate our y value. It's very similar to the x value, so I'm going to start just by copying this whole section. First, instead of multiplying our, our sign value by a, we're multiplying it by b. So we'll drag b out from our group input over to here. Then on our inside term, we have f multiplied by beta, which we said was going to be 1. Multiplying by 1 here doesn't actually do anything. But later, if we wanted to parameterize these values, it would be nice that we could plug these straight in. For now, I'm just going to mute this node because it doesn't do anything. Then we're multiplying by our length, and instead of adding delta, we're going to subtract it. And then we'll plug this value into our y. One thing you may have noticed in this equation is that t is supposed to go from 0 to 1, which would be our factor instead of the length. Now that we have our x and y created, Let's go ahead and apply this. Let's go ahead and apply this to our current strands. We'll use a set position node and set the position to this vector. We'll set our width and height to 1, our frequency to 1, and our number of strands to 3. Now you'll notice that I'm not getting anything here. A quick review of our node tree shows that when we added the duplicate elements node, we didn't set it to spline. At this point, you've got kind of what looks like a mess and looks nothing like a braid. The reason for this is that we only have a few control vertices for our curve. And we'll need a lot more if we're gonna have a nice smooth curve. If we jump back to the beginning of our node tree, let's add a resample curve node to our geometry input. And while we get some more geometry here, we still don't have much of a shape. If we increase this count though, it turns into this shape. Because we'll want control over this resolution, let's add this to our input and call it resolution. The shape that's created here is called a Lissajous curve. And this is the shape that each of our strands is going to traverse as it goes along the guide curve. And then each strand will be offset just a little bit. Right now, since we've only given the x and y coordinate, we can see that this is laying flat on the xy plane. So now we need to map this along our guide curve. Shutting off our node tree for a moment, we'll give our guide curve some shape. And so we can see what we're doing. We'll control shift right click on our input and connect it to this last node. But right now, that's just going to let us see our guide curve while we're working on our other curves. Now while it looks like our Lissajous curve is just one figure eight, this is actually the entire length of the curve all stacked up on top of each other in one spot. If we were just to take our curve spline parameter and add the factor in here, you can see what we've actually got. So to spread these out, we'll take the current point along our curve and map the new point to it. So if we take our curve and do a capture attribute and capture the position, making sure to change it to vector, and then we add to that the xy coordinate that we've got from our Lissajous curve, we start to get somewhere. Our Lissajous curve is a little big, so we'll lower the a and b values. 
We can also lower the frequency if we like. Now while this is looking better, we're not quite there yet. You can see that when the curve is going straight up and down, it aligns nicely to the braid, but as soon as it starts to turn, it flattens out. That's because while we mapped our Lissajou curve along our guide curve, we only did it in the X and Y plane. We haven't actually rotated those new points so that they match up to the existing curve. So not only do we need to combine our X and Y values to the current position, we need to rotate them first. But what do we rotate them to? We want the center point of each of the strands to be our guide curve, and we want them rotated around and pointing in the same direction as the guide curve. Well, our guide curve has its tangent. This is the direction the curve is pointing at any given point. So if I capture a second attribute, and this time I capture the curve, curve tangent, I can now use this value to rotate our points. But given this XY position, how do we use the tangent to rotate it? Well, first, we need to determine what rotation our tangent has. So we're going to use the Align Euler to Vector node. The vector that we want to align the Euler rotation to is our tangent. And the axis of rotation that we want to align to that rotation is Z, because our Lissajous curve was oriented on the XY plane so it's pointing up and down along the z-axis. So this output will give us a rotation that lines up the way we want. So now we can rotate our x and y positions by this rotation by using a vector rotate node. Since we generated an Euler here, we'll change this type to Euler. The center of our rotation is 0, 0, 0 because that's where our Lissajous curve is centered and we'll plug the rotation in that we generated. Now, depending on your height, width, and frequency, you'll want to adjust your resolution so that it reduces artifacts as much as possible. Now that we have these lined up, I'm gonna remove our connection to our original curve, and now we have a nice curve here. To clean this up, I'll take this section, join it, and name it Z and Rotation. Now, if I was just using this on Bezier curves, I would go ahead and add a curve to mesh node here and give these curves some thickness. However, since I want to use these on a hair object, I need to leave these as curves. So in this case, if I wanted to see this Bezier curve with some thickness, I could add another geometry node tree, create a new one, and then here do a curve to mesh, a curve circle, and reduce the size. Going back to my braid node tree, I'm going to give this a name of braid and hit the shield so it's saved. Now let's use our braid node tree in a hair setup. I'll delete this bezier curve and add in a new object that we can add some hair to. I'll just use an icosphere. With the icosphere selected, I'll hit shift A, go to curve and choose empty hair. With the hair curves object selected, I'll go into sculpt mode. I'll choose the add hairbrush and give it a click. Using the snake hook brush, I'll pull this hair out. Now in my modifiers, you'll see a node tree with surface to form. We'll leave that as the first node tree. We'll add a new geometry nodes modifier. And instead of creating a new tree, we'll select braid. We'll do three strands, increase the height and width, and increase the frequency. We may also want to add another node tree, and in this one, do a curve, set curve radius, and then drag our radius out to the node tree. And then we can adjust our radius from here. You'll see that there's not much geometry here in solid shaded mode. If we go up to our render settings tab, and go down to curves, we can adjust the viewport display and increase this. However, keeping this lower will help with performance. If we go into rendered mode, we'll be able to see the actual output. Make sure to lower your resolution to the smallest acceptable amount. 
In this case, I only need 14 to get a good looking curve. Now I can play with my settings to get the braids that I want. And now each hair that I add will be its own braid. So that does it for this first video. I know this one was a bit of a doozy, and I hope you stuck with it through the whole thing. In future videos in this series, we'll look at changing each one of these strands into groupings of multiple hairs. Plus, we'll also look at ways to vary the size and shape of our braids along the braids and along the scalp object that we use. Anyway, even though there was a lot of math in this one, I hope it inspires you to make something awesome. And until next time,